Welcome to the Unlocking the Club podcast, where we host honest and direct conversations about journeys of access, personal truth, and reclaiming space. We share our truth so that you can find the key to own your truth, honor your journey, and reclaim your space. Grab your keys, your wallet, your phone, and invite your friends to meet you at the club. Here's your host, Angela Taylor. Welcome to a very, very special series of Unlocking the Club, where we explore one of the most important yet often overlooked conversations that we can have, a conversation about estate planning and elder care. I'm your host, Angela Taylor, and over the past few years, my family, my friends, and, and I, we've learned the hard way about the critical importance of having a will or a trust in place. When unexpected moments arise, not having a plan can leave families vulnerable, and I've seen firsthand how it can create chaos during already challenging times. Recently, I conducted a poll and the results were startling. 80% of the people that I polled between the ages of 20 and 65 don't have a will or a trust in place. Even more striking is that most of those who do take action, it's only after experiencing a tragic event in their family. National data suggests and supports this as well, with studies showing that a significant majority of adults, particularly between and within the Black and BIPOC communities, have not taken steps to secure their legacies. And when we fail to plan, we leave our families with legal battles, financial burdens, and emotional stress that can take years to untangle. That's why here at Unlocking the Club, we're dedicating an entire 12-part series to unlocking the essentials of estate planning with bonus episodes focused on adjacent topics. Together with two brilliant minds, Shane Jasmine Young from Young Law Group and Verlena Green Tuluska from VDG Law Group, we'll break down what you need to know about protecting your assets, building a legacy, and making sure your loved ones are cared for when it matters the most. Our goal in this series is to equip you with the knowledge and the tools to take action now before life forces you to. Whether you're just starting out or navigating the complexities of caring for aging loved ones, these conversations will give you the clarity and the confidence to plan for your future. So grab your notebooks, tune in, and let's unlock this critical conversation together. Welcome to Unlocking the Club's special series on estate planning and elder care. of attorney is a critical tool in estate planning, but many people don't fully understand the significance or the different types that are available. So today, we'll break down what a power of attorney or POA is, why you need one, and how it fits into your broader estate planning journey. Joining us today to discuss the power of attorney is Verlina Green Tuluska of VDG Law Group. Verlina, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you so much, Angela, for having me. Well, as a follow-up to our, our great conversation with you earlier, we got to know you and your journey, and so many of our listeners, uh, it res your conversation resonated with them, and, and it was evident of your passion for this work. So I very much am looking forward to having this conversation over the next several weeks with you about estate planning and elder care. And starting with the power of attorney, just wondering if you can explain what a power of attorney, in fact, is and why it's such an important part of the estate planning process. Thank you, Angela. A power of attorney is a critical part of any estate plan. And I always tell my clients that think of a power of attorney as something that you may need if you became incapacitated. So a lot of us, we're young, we're vibrant, we're not thinking about that. Accidents do happen. So for example, if you were to walk outside, get hit by a car, you're in a coma, mm. and you go into the hospital, you're unable to make financial decisions for yourself. So you would have to appoint someone before you became incapacitated as what we call your power of attorney to make those decisions for you. So for example, think of 
um, a drunk driver who you're hit by and your family wants to sue that person. In order for that to happen, you would have to have a power of attorney to bring that particular lawsuit. What about paying your bills? If you're in the hospital, you're unable to manage your own finances, who's going to do that on your behalf? Who has access to your bank account, right? Let's say something happens where you need to pull money out of your home and you're incapacitated. Who's going to be able to do that and sign for you? People can't just willy nilly sign on your behalf. Yeah. They have to have some sort of legal document in place in order to represent you, sign on your behalf, handle financial matters on your behalf. So I always say it is a completion of your estate plan. Yes, your will and trust are what we call your meat and potatoes, but your power of attorney and your advanced health care directive, those are your side dishes. In order to complete that plan, make sure you have something in place because if you become incapacitated, no one can speak on your behalf. Yes, I love the, the side dishes, right? Some really important side dishes. And if you're like me, I love the side dishes as almost as much as everything else. Uh, and, and, you know, it's it's really interesting as you were talking about the importance of a power of attorney. I thought back to a recent situation where a friend of the family actually um, ended up in the hospital and uh, no one knew about it. Um, his family, his, his uh, children are out of state. Uh, and then they contacted, luckily, some of his friends contacted the hospital found out that he was in the hospital, could not get in touch with his next of kin, and no one was able to actually help make decisions about what hospital he was gonna to go to, what type of care he was gonna receive because they did not have a power of attorney in place. And this took the course of about you know a week and a half to two weeks where he was in somewhat of a standstill as his near and dear friends here locally were trying to help him out, but they could not make any, they couldn't find out about his health care um, with his doctors. They cannot inform or share information with them, and they certainly can make decisions. So um, having that document was incredibly important. So when you talk about these appetizers or side dishes, what different types of power of attorney should people consider? So you just um, really kind of alluded to the other type of power of attorney. That's what we call an advanced health care directive and a power of attorney for health. The power of attorney that um, I want to make a distinction is, is your power of attorney for finances. Okay. And that one is a durable power of attorney. And it's what we call typically a springing power of attorney. Because if you have capacity, you don't have dementia, you don't have Alzheimer's, you have your capabilities, you didn't, you're not in the hospital, you're not unconscious, you're able to write your checks, do your own financial transactions. The power of attorney that's springing, it springs into action when your medical doctor says, hey, this person is unable to make decisions on their own. So we don't want people just all in your business before they need to be. <laughs> exactly. Put something in place that says, when I need you, then you can spring into action. So that's mm -hmm. why I typically create a springing power of attorneys for my clients. And that's one sort of power of attorney. A different power of attorney that you talked about earlier is your power of attorney for health. And that's a different one. And we'll go into that in just a little bit, because that's also a two part document. That's a power of attorney for health and also combining what we call your advanced health care directive. Mm. Well, when you talk about the springing uh, documents, uh, I'm curious, you just think about the family dynamics. Right. Family dynamics come into play so often in this particular aspect of our journey. So how do you as an individual or how does your family determine who should be appointed as the agent under the power of attorney uh, and what responsibilities do, do individuals have as a result of it? I love that question. And it's a very important one because I do have some clients who are older and who say, you know what, I just want my oldest child to be in this particular uh, position as my power of attorney. They feel they have to do it. They, they want the oldest child to feel empowered. And I always say, it may not be the oldest child. It's the child who is able to manage finances in a responsible way. You want someone in a position who's going to be able to take care of your finances even better 
than they would their own because they have what we call a fiduciary duty. They can be sued if they manage your money in an inappropriate way. They have to be able to keep track of all of their expenses, all of the invoices, all the receipts, keep track of bank statements to make sure if somebody in the family says, you know what, what are you doing? I have questions about how you're managing mom or dad or aunt or grandmother's finances. That person is able to produce the documents and the backup to say, no, I've been managing this person's finances appropriately. So when you're thinking about who should you make your power of attorney, think of someone who's financially responsible. Yeah, that's such a good point. I, I recall actually um, the attorney for our family who helped us um, with our um, estate planning process uh, talked about for his family, everyone wanted him to be appointed the power of attorney. Okay. And because that's his job, right? And I know, Verlina, you've talked about this on this episode, right? Your family reached out to you. And what he said for some of his, the elders in his family, he wasn't close proximity to them. And so it may not have made as much sense for him to have been the, the person. Uh, and he really implored his family to be thoughtful about the right person. But I think a lot of times there are politics at play. You don't want feelings to get hurt. Uh, you know, maybe there's somebody who um, oftentimes the women, in the family tend to be the ones that are, are are managing care processes, but it is something that should be discussed universally about why, how, and who um, is receiving this um, really um, important responsibility. Absolutely. And I think um, just because you have someone who's managing your care, you also you don't need to make them your power of attorney and manage your finances. So those two things can be distinct. Someone can be great at caretaking and making sure that you get to your doctor's appointments and you can even live with someone and they don't necessarily have to manage your finances and manage your money and manage the checkbook, right? So we should also think about the person who is um, going to be able to be financially responsible. Close proximity is a good one. But I often have clients who put someone else in charge who's not in close proximity because they are the person who's best at managing those finances. So we always have to keep that in mind that it doesn't necessarily have to be the same person managing the finances and doing the caretaking. Often they it's different. It's a different person. Um, and I also uh, tell my clients, you don't necessarily have to have an individual. Some people have fiduciaries who are professionals and companies who are managing their finances and who they appoint as their power of attorney if they became incapacitated. And that comes into play, particularly if you have someone with a high net worth. Okay. Okay. So what I'm hearing is you can, in essence, tailor your your plan um, to your needs. So if it's the financial aspect, if it's the healthcare aspects, if there's other elements um, that you need to be taken care of, and there's people in your your network or your circle that may be experts, or it could be proximity, you can tailor um, it to your specific needs and have multiple people responsible for your power of attorney. Multiple people responsible for different aspects. So one okay. person financial power of attorney, one person okay. power of attorney for health, and those are okay. two separate documents. Okay. Well, and you just mentioned something that um, really I, I want to dig into is so often when we hear the phrase estate planning, I think many of us jump to the conclusion that it's just for those that are wealthy or affluent and yes. it's not for everybody. It's not for um, the everyday person. What yep. are some of the common misconceptions about the power of attorney that you frequently encountered and how do we dispel those misconceptions? Um, like you said, one is that it's for wealthy people and it's really not. It's for everyday individuals and people who don't have a lot of wealth should be mindful that this is extremely important for you because what happens if you don't have these documents in place? And I always talk about the what if piece and the what if piece is that you or your family will go through the conservatorship process. 
And this actually happened. I tell this story um, often because I want people to get into action. And it's not to scare you, it's just to inform you of the other side of things and how it could look if you don't have a financial power of attorney in place. So I give these talks in my community and churches and at, um, in community spaces often. So I have one young lady and she said, you know, Verlina, I need to talk to you. And she said, I came to one of your events and I heard about the power of attorney and I don't know what to do because my aunt, she is young, she was in her forties and she had a brain aneurysm mm -hmm. and she had children who were in grade school and in high school. And she said, we don't, they don't have, they don't own a home, but they do have, you know, bills to pay. They have their rent to pay. And we don't have anyone who's able to access their mother's accounts. Wow. What do we do? And I said, well, we can't do a power of attorney. It's too late. She lacks capacity. She's unconscious. She can't sign documents and understand what a power of attorney is. She's unconscious. So you have to come up with the funds in order to establish a conservatorship. And what a conservatorship here is here in California, every state has something different. Some um, states call them guardianships for elders. But what it typically is, it says that if you're incapacitated, you didn't sign a document alerting individuals who's going to be the person to take care of your finances if you were incapacitated. So now you need a judge to sign off on who's going to be the person who's able to take care of your finances because you're now incapacitated. And it creates a lot of issues. One, financially. A power of attorney, typically in California, depending on what attorney you go to, can range between $500 and $1,000. An advanced health care directive, same thing. Conservatorships on a yearly basis, they can range from $10,000 to $30,000. What? And the interesting thing is if you have a conservatorship that's contested, Let's say mom didn't sign a power of attorney. She becomes incapacitated. You have two adult children who say, no, I want to take care of mom. No, I want to be the person to take care of mom's finances. You have a fight. Yeah. And what happens then? Thousands of dollars of attorney's fees go into fighting. They both have to hire their own attorney. They have to pay fees to the courts. They have to pay what we call investigator fees. They have to pay filing fees, all sorts of fees. And I had one conservatorship in particular that I litigated in 2017. I litigated a temporary conservatorship because the person needed someone who um, temporarily would be taking care of finances. And then we needed a permanent conservatorship long term. Right. This person had dementia. So we needed someone who was going to be able to manage this um, person's finances on a long term basis. We ended up in the first year spending about sixty thousand dollars in attorney's fees. When we could have spent maybe five hundred to a thousand dollars on a power of attorney when the person had capacity to say this is the person who I want to manage my finances if I became incapacitated. I mean, that in and of itself is reason enough to prioritize this for everybody, right? Everybody in your family, regardless of uh, their status, regardless of their age, regardless of the current state of their health, like $500 to $1,000 versus $60,000 and, and up, because it can happen to any of us. Any of us can be in a car accident tomorrow or, or something tragic can happen. So that is evidence enough. Absolutely. And back to that person who um, was unable to get that um, power of attorney and the, the mother who had two children and they were just saying, we just need to get access to the bank account to pay rent. I said, OK, the fees for starting a conservatorship would be around ten thousand dollars. And they said, you know what, we have to do a GoFundMe page. 
yeah. right? Because we don't have that. Don't have All that. we're looking to do, can we please just get into this person <laughs> out? And I exactly. said, no, <laughs> no yeah. way you can do that without a court order. Yeah. Well, and, and things that we, we really don't think about for, for many reasons. I think that this is a, a topic that's taboo. I think in other countries, uh, the aging process or life process uh, is, is something that they deal with and they talk about quite often. But here in North America, um, it's something that is, is tainted or taboo. And, and we don't have this conversation because maybe we think we're going to jinx somebody. Um, but it's really important to prepare in advance, literally for this reason. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, uh, Relina, so as you're going through the process, can you change the agents that you have on a regular basis? And how frequently should you um, reevaluate who is managing your, your portfolio? Well, it really depends. You know, everybody's situation, if you have someone who you trust and you make them your power of attorney and they pass away or they become incapacitated or they have um, different responsibilities that pop up in their life, you might want to also have that conversation. Hey, I made you my power of attorney. Are you able to do that if something happens to me? Can you manage my finances? So I tell people to always evaluate when there's births, there's deaths in the family, reevaluate your entire estate plan. In terms of your power of attorney specifically, you should always um, look at that power of attorney 10 years down the line and say every 10 years, who's this person? Do I even like them? Right? Because yeah. our relationships, they're ever changing. This yeah. is life, right? So you make it, you, I have people who make their friends power of attorneys, right? I have people who make their CPAs or their attorneys, their power of attorney. So those relationships, they often change. So you want to make sure that you have who you want in place to make your financial decisions to be the person who you want in place. Mm -hmm. When you're thinking about that, how and I know you've had some stories, but how can a power attorney help prevent those family conflicts or reduce some of the legal complications um, in these emergency situations? Power attorneys are, are great if they are honest and they're forthcoming with the family, they understand how to um, budget and they understand how to manage someone else's finances. They can be life-saving, right? They can make sure that the person has the care that they need if they are older in age, that their bills are paid on time, that the person doesn't get behind on taxes, um, that the person is maintaining their insurance, and that the person's finances are managed in a way that protects them from uh, lawsuits, for example, if the power of attorney, for example, needs to manage their business. I have a lot of uh, clients who own businesses. And what happens if they're no longer able to manage their business? Yeah. Right? Yeah. We need someone who's able to pay their bills uh, because we don't want that person sued, right? We want to yeah. make sure that that financial um, well-being is handled in a way that respects that person and that is done in a way where we don't have family members who are coming after them saying, you don't know what you're doing. You are taking money to take care of yourself, for example. Uh, so we understand that that person has a high uh, moral compass and it, mm -hmm is preventing something terrible from happening and that person getting behind on bills, simple things, making sure that bills are paid on time, that they have their lights on, their water on, right? We don't think about those simple things yeah. that if you don't pay those bills. Yeah, their property taxes. <laughs> their property, property tax taxes and lose that asset. Yeah. Exactly. So we want to make sure that someone is able to um, maintain your financial life if something happens and that the loved ones are working in conjunction with that power of attorney to make sure that this person who lost capacity is okay financially. Well, now that uh, we are listening to your recommendations, I have a feeling that many of the people listening to Unlocking the Club are going to go out and look into setting up a power of attorney. Are there any risks or limitations with power of attorneys that people should be aware of before establishing one? That's a good question. Uh, there definitely are risks. 
in terms of establishing power of attorney, one of the risks are um, you put somebody who's in place, who's your power of attorney, who spends the money on themselves. So that is definitely an inherent risk. I've seen power of attorneys transfer assets to themselves like homes as power of attorneys. I've seen power of attorneys uh, transfer in, I mean, take assets, whatever it is, stocks, bonds, and transfer it to themselves. That's one of the risks. So sometimes what I tell my clients is that you might want to get a power of attorney, which indicates the person needs to be bonded, which is insurance. Okay. And you also um, can make a power of attorney, a professional fiduciary. You're, you can make someone who is a professional fiduciary, your power of attorney, if they have, um, if the person has a lot of assets, you want to make sure if you have a 20 to $30 million estate, maybe you don't want your children managing it because they're not financially responsible. Maybe you want someone who has experience with managing large, um, large amounts of money to be managing your assets. Okay. Now that's really important. Well, and you mentioned something earlier, you talked about um, if you have a business, like also mm -hmm. planning for what's going to happen um, to your business. I think so many folks in our audience are entrepreneurs, small business owners. Maybe it is a side hustle or a side business, but um, it's a business nonetheless that's generating some revenue or income for their family. Um, any advice for, for them and making sure that they're not just considering their own personal assets, but also um, any uh, augmentation to their, their assets? Absolutely. In my power of attorneys, I do a comprehensive power of attorneys, not the statutory ones that you can get offline and check boxes. My power of attorneys are about 20 pages. And it makes sure that your power of attorney says, this person has the ability to manage my business, to vote, to proxy on my behalf if I'm unable to. So we have to think about those nuances when we're setting up these documents, because if your power of attorney specifically doesn't say, if I become incapacitated, this person is able to do this, then they're not able to do that. If your power of attorney doesn't say, my power of attorney can manage my business, your power of attorney will be unable to manage your business. So make sure that it's written specifically in your power of attorney that the person can do that, that they can collect uh, profits from your business and put them into your account and pay you for those um, sales or for those services that you've generated in your business. What else, Relena, should we all know about the power of attorney? Um, I think that is kind of a catch all. So we have a living trust. And if you become incapacitated, your trustee or your successor is able to manage assets that are um, included in your living trust in that Schedule A. Your power of attorney is a catch all. We don't have everything as an asset in our living trust. What about if you became eligible to governmental benefits? Who's going to sign off on that? Who's going to do your tax returns? Right. Who's going to make sure that if you have a bank account just in your name, who's going to be able to get access to those? So your power of attorney is a catch all to your entire financial life. Someone who's going to be able to sign contracts on your behalf, someone who's going to be able to defend if you're sued or sue someone if you're entitled to something on your behalf. So it's an important document. And there are nuances that um, I can't go into today because there's so many different types of power. <laughs> so, so many complexities, right? What, which is your springing durable power of attorney. Durable, right. meaning that it is going to be in place if you become incapacitated. Springing, it springs into place if you become incapacitated. We have so many different other types. We have the limited power of attorney, the non-durable power of attorney. But what you need to know, and the most important one, is that springing power of attorney, if you became incapacitated, you want someone to be able to manage your finances, sign contracts on your behalf, do your taxes, and make sure that your financial well-being is taken care of. Hmm. 
Wow. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I feel so much better about the grasp around uh, the power of attorney because it does feel like such a complex topic. And I think it, if you're like me, sometimes the complexities have you pause and maybe not approach it just yet. So um, I appreciate the insights um, and perspective that you shared around the power of attorney. I think we've covered a lot of ground on a really important topic. Uh, and just to recap, as Verlina just mentioned, the power of attorney, there's a lot of different power of attorneys. Um, there's a lot of information that you can get on the internet. Uh, you can go to, there's a lot of um, like free legal advice that you can find in your community as well. Like as you're exploring, accessing a power of attorney, find out about what is right for you and tailored for you at this particular um, journey in your life, whether it is durable um, power of attorney or the springing power of attorney. Um, but we've talked a lot about that and really unpacked how these tools are essential for protecting not just your assets, but your wishes and your loved one's wishes as well. Um, so really in leaving us today, what would one single most important takeaway that you can share with our listeners? Get one in place, <laughs> no matter what your net worth looks like. If you have a dollar, if you have $10 million, get a power of attorney in place. It's better to do a power of attorney than have to go to court and get a conservatorship. Mm mic drop right there. <laughs> one thing that you can act on today, not tomorrow, not on January 1st of 2025, but today, that would be to go ahead and get a power of attorney in place, no matter what your state in life is. Get that power of attorney in place and encourage your family and your friends to do so as well. Uh, Rolina, thank you so much for that. It's clear that taking these small proactive steps can really make a world of difference um, down the road as we are planning our legacies, whatever that entails. And so I thank you. It's been a pleasure having you on the Luck in the Club today. Thank you for sharing your perspective and expertise on power of attorneys. And I look forward to staying in conversation around some other topics around estate planning and elder care as well. Thank you, Angela. All right. That is uh, another episode of Unlocking the Club, part of our 12 part series on estate planning and elder care. Please, please, the best thing that you can do for your legacy and for your family's well-being is to take the step today in putting a power of attorney in place. For the Unlocking the Club crew, I'm your host, Angela Taylor. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, be well. Thanks for listening to Unlocking the Club. If this conversation resonated with you, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or your favorite streaming platform so that you can experience every episode. And follow us on social media where you'll hear about future guests, access special features, and connect with this amazing community. Head on over there and let us know how you are unlocking the club. Until next time, peace.